Welcome back. President Trump's refusal to concede amid legal challenges has a lot of people wondering what's next. Here to talk to us about it is Devin Schindler, a constitutional law professor at Cooley Law School. Thank you so much for joining us, Devin. The pleasure is all mine. Okay, so I want to start out with these lawsuits. The president has had continued attacks on the legal process as well as false allegations of widespread voter fraud. Can you talk about the merit these legal accusations have? Well, I've counted 12, approximately 12 lawsuits that Trump, uh, the Trump administration or Trump supporters have filed. And they have two consistent themes. One, we're playing small ball. There's not a single one of these lawsuits that's going to upset the election, even if the allegations are true. For example, uh, in Georgia, they attacked 53 ballots. In Nevada, they're unhappy about the signature machine. Uh, many of these lawsuits are, please let us stand closer while the vote goes on. None of these lawsuits, in my mind, with the exception of one, and even that I'll talk about in a minute, probably is not going to change anything. None of these are going to flip, even if they're right, are going to flip very many votes. Uh, the second thing is evidence. You know, we have a system of justice where you have to put on evidence. There simply hasn't been much in the way of evidence presented. Uh, the Michigan lawsuits are a classic example of this. And one of their allegations, which was dismissed, uh, the Trump uh, campaign made the allegation that somebody told someone overhearing someone talking about maybe changing a date. The court said, well, that's hearsay. There's no real evidence that any dates were changed in terms of uh, when ballots were received and threw out that claim. So we're seeing a consistent pattern here of lawsuits that really don't, aren't gonna move the needle in any, any measurable way or have been dismissed or don't have any evidence. Now, the one possible exception along the way was the Supreme Court had considered a suit that would have limited Pennsylvania's ability to count votes that were received after election day. But from everything I'm hearing, there are not even enough votes involved to change the outcome of the election. So even that suit, is probably going nowhere. Lack of evidence, small cases. Uh, I don't see anything at this point that's going to move the needle towards President Trump. Okay, and then once this lawsuit situation plays out, then there are the concerns over a smooth transfer of power, a concession. So what precedents or legal obligations does the president have to follow here? Well, in terms of legal obligations, there's not much. Uh, January 6th, there'll be a transfer of power. Uh, but there are a series of norms that have developed over the years. The norm of the president meeting with the president-elect uh, on the final couple of days and talking about what's going on. There's been uh, norms where, uh, say, the Secretary of Labor will talk about the, talk to the incoming Secretary of Labor. And President Obama even prepared transfer books to help ease the transfer power, which I'm told the Trump administration basically threw out. There's a series of norms, but if we know anything about this president, uh, he ignores norms. So we're in a bit of uncharted territory. Uh, what do we do if, if President Trump flatly refuses to accept the outcome of the election? Could he make the transfer power difficult? Absolutely. Not return phone calls, not prepare briefing books, refuse to meet. Uh, so his legal obligations here are really none. It's a series of norms that most presidents, outgoing presidents, have followed. Hopefully they'll be followed here. And in President-elect Biden's victory speech yesterday, he announced this COVID task force that he's going to be forming on Monday, announcing the people he's appointing to that. But he could really be inhibited with that if the president doesn't help with this smooth transfer here. That's absolutely correct. This new task force has absolutely no power until the transfer of power in January. You know, at that point, uh, President Biden, President-elect Biden can issue executive orders reversing some of the decisions previously made by the Trump administration. Uh, he can institute different plans and policies. So I think what this task force is really going to be doing is helping the president-elect write executive orders uh, dealing with the COVID crisis that he can issue on day one. They're really preparing for when the formal transfer of power occurs. Really fantastic information. We appreciate you. That was Devin Schindler, constitutional law professor at Cooley Law School. We'll be back.